Hi, this is Mike Paulson with another Bible study video presentation of the risen Savior Jesus Christ from a King James 1611 Bible only, teaching the simplicity that is in Christ by presenting Paul's greater commission during this dispensation of the grace of God, of course, emphasizing the goodness of God by rightly dividing the word of truth in the King James 1611 Bible and according to the Apostle Paul only. If you're new to my presentations, I have some scriptures right there that uh, back up what I was saying as far as what my ministry of such is. Uh, so check those verses out, put it on pause, and check those verses out. Otherwise, let's just keep going here in part three. These are answers to the questions that I had directed towards pastors, evangelists, missionaries, Bible students, teachers, active Christians, believers, like some of them like to be called. Church going people, teenagers, young adults, and I'm emphasizing and actually adding here uh, Bible believers, and to be very specific, uh, Ruckmanites, former or at present time. In an earlier presentation, I had asked you a few questions to give you an opportunity to convince me how I am so wrong about preaching the gospel of the uncircumcision committed unto Paul in the manner I do, Paul only. So I challenge you to just change my mind if you can. But now, in part three, as well as part two and part one of the answers, it's my turn. Uh, you've had your chance. I haven't read all the replies, but I don't want to take the time for replies as much as email. So if you have some some things to say to me, uh, send them to my email, susanmanatcox.net. And uh, save yourself the time of, you know, telling me what you think about what you're teaching. No, you're just supposed to try to change my mind. I challenge you to change my mind in that I'm wrong with what I say. You simply cannot follow both Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel. And we're going to look at that today a little closer than we have in the past. In fact, I think my part two might have been a little bit of confusing on the notes so let's, let's just kind of pin this down even closer today. The gospel of the circumcision unto Peter and the gospel of the uncircumcision unto Paul. Keep this in mind. God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Well, everybody kind of thinks that, but they don't realize that it's according to my gospel, and that's Paul's gospel. So part three... Let's look at some of these questions now. Uh, the uh, yellowish ones were part one, the light blue were part two, and then these dark blue ones will be today. And the one on the left there, why do you not instruct your people to follow all of Paul's teachings? We're going to look at that a little closer as far as the uncircumcision and the circumcision. One to Paul, one to Peter. So we're going to look at that a little closer today. And then do you believe and teach that we are in the Laodicean church age? And then we look at why do you think people tend to look forward more to their disappearing rather than them loving his appearing? And we'll touch on those a little bit too. So let's jump into this one, the gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of the circumcision. We're looking at Galatians 2, 7. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, Gentiles, was committed unto me, Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision, Jews, was unto Peter. And changing the word of to the word to gives it a totally different meaning and application. Would anybody do such a thing? Yes, somebody did do such a thing, and I was surprised beyond surprise to know who it was, uh, Dr. Ruckman, who the, the one that really stirs up the whole anti-hyper, anti-Paul crowd. When I listened to him, I can, there's a testimony there, but I'll skip it. When I just, I thought I'd listen to him and see what he says about the hypers, because I don't believe I'm a hyper at all. I've not studied hyper. I've never studied the people that teach hyper. I've never studied the grace only ministry stuff. I've just read, studied, rightly divided my King James Bible. And it's as simple as the simplicity in Christ. But this guy, who is a solid King James guy, and took on all the people that made any corrections. And yet, 
in his hyper-dispensation sermon against the hypers, he changed the word of to the word to. I couldn't believe it. So to change that, and other people do this as well. This is the direction they go, uh, but they don't change the two words. They just teach it the way they want to teach it. But this is a specific change from the word of to the word to. But contrary to life, when they saw that the gospel to the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel to the circumcision was under Peter. That's the way they change it. So what they're saying then is it's the same gospel that's taken to the Jews, and Peter's the one that takes that to the Jews, and Paul is the one that takes that same gospel to the Gentiles. And if that's the case, then right division would be based on their biblical education or their pastor, which is what people do. People are afraid to hear the word Paul. They think we're hyper. Why? Because Dr. Reckman taught us so, or other pastors have. You cannot go to Paul only if you're going to change that to two. It creates a hyper when they change that. Is that just wild? So we're going to look at P Peter's gospel sort of of the circumcision, but he kind of mixes, they mix, mix it all up, and they use Gospels, they use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they use Acts chapters 1 through 8, they use the books from Hebrews to Revelation, mostly Hebrews to Jude, but there are a couple of chapters in Revelation they misapply to people today, which I'll show you at the end of this thing, and they do look at Paul a little bit so they can honestly say, yeah, we teach Paul. Well, not really, you don't. And even the, even the fact, I'll do another message on this, the people that say they teach Paul, really, I've come to the conclusion they really don't teach Paul only. They say they do, but I can convince, I can show them that they don't, but that's not today. We're looking at Peter's gospel of the circumcision, and we're going to look at Paul's gospel of the circumcision, which is Romans to Philemon only. Of course, I teach the other books, Genesis through Revelation. And if you read those other books, it helps you understand the Jews. So I'm not a Paul-only uh, reader. I'm a Paul-only applier. But you read the entire Bible, and you get an understanding about the Jews and the, and the situation. Hebrews 11 talks, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 11 talks about that. And if you don't understand that stuff between the Jews and the Gentiles, you become a very conceited, arrogant, judgmental, modern-day Christian. But let's just keep going here. So Peter's gospel of the circumcision, Peter and the apostles' gospel. They, they work together, and then Peter kind of takes it for one later. But in general, it's the apostolic doctrine. It's corrupt and mixed up today. They teach it today, so that makes it corrupt. It's mixed up. They go from books all over the place. But it is accepted and is encouraged, and believe it or not, it is forced on the people. Because if you don't believe it, or if you start to challenge it, oh, are you picked out of the crowd and challenged back? And eventually you end up either leaving on your own choice, yay for you, because it'll count for your uh, judgment seat positive, and if you're kicked out, it, it's, it's an honor, I guess, but uh, it's too bad pastors, uh, they allow all sorts of Bibles, all sorts of teachings, but they will not allow King James Bible or Paul only as a teacher. Okay, let's move along here. Paul's gospel of the circumcision. Paul's gospel is the truth today. It is truth, not just the truth. It is truth today. However, in the churches and in people's lives, because of their pastors, it's rejected. It's hated. It's ignored and purposely not taught. You know, a little bunny trail here. When we when we see what's going on in this country, the, the, the government, we have a constitution, we have a single constitution, and we know that we have strayed from that constitution. And the people who are just like dumb little sheep just go along with it, and they're finding out it's too late. The leaders have lied to them for years and years and years, and it's, it's too late. People have been deceived because their leaders have been liars. Even the good leaders, uh, you find lies in there. Well, it's the same thing in the church. People have quit reading that King James Bible. They got other modern Bibles, and they finally got tired of those because the pastors put them up on these great big huge screens in their theaters instead of their churches for entertainment. And so the way it is now, uh, 
they don't they don't like the King James Bible. They reject the King James Bible. They reject Paul's teachings. And the King James Bible is like the Constitution for Christianity. Well, the pastors are just as much of deceivers. They're evil seducers, is what Paul, what Paul talks about in Second Timothy chapter three. So they are as much of a liar and deceiver as the politicians in America. And actually. I blame the pastors being deceived more than the politicians because the pastors could have straightened this out, kept this from happening way back in the 1700s. So anyway, I just had to throw that in. Thinking about that today, people are really mad at the politicians. People need to get mad at their pastors too and realize they've been lied to for all these years. Moving along, let's look at Peter's stuff here. Now, they all talk about a new life. Oh, I have a new life. Get a new life. Sure. And that life is start over. It's what it is. It's a start over their life. And, and what, you, what, you, what you find out that it is, it's a start over, but they find out they have to do works, good works, to keep God. Otherwise, God breaks relationship with them. Some people even teach to lose their salvation. But they do teach a new life. Who doesn't want a new life? Well, a lot of people don't want a new life. They think their life is fine. So that's a pretty... Pretty hokey way to start this whole thing. Well, what about Paul's side? Well, we have a new life, but our works that we do either build or burn. And I could do a sermon on that new life. But see, our new life is a different kind of a new life. And I'll show you here in a minute. They talk about being born again. Well, they go to John for some of the good verses. They might throw in Romans once in a while, but they love the book of John because it all talks about believing. They don't realize, though, that in John it talks about believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's it. That's, the, that's being born again. Well, we're quickened. We're made alive by faith and trust. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're relatively new. Uh, drop me a line. I'll help you get it. But uh, most of us have been on these presentations before. They want a new life. We get a new life. They, need, they think they need to be born again. So see, they can start over that new life. No, we are made alive. We are given a new life made alive and it's by faith and trust and this what really what really clicked for me here was i looked up i kind of started to study the words creation and creature they teach that everybody becomes a new creation well this new creation the goal is to stop sinning romans chapter 6 verse 1 just talks about uh dead to sin they bought their bibles change it to stop sinning and the modern bible guys teach it like it says sinning, even though it says sin. Dead in sins, they're still dead in sins. So you see, the folks are still, I mean, God makes the call, not me. He knows their heart. But generally, according to doctrine, these people are still dead in their sins. If their goal is to stop sinning, either they're not saved or they've just been, they're going to be frustrated. They're going to be, they're going to hate it. After a while, they quit. They leave. Because they just can't stop sinning, pastors. Okay, I guess to get back on the trail here. So they teach a new creation. They think you should stop sinning now that you've got Jesus, you know. And uh, we read in the King James Bible, we're a new creature. We are made alive. We are now dead to sin, dead to the law. We're completely a new creature. So it has to be the word creature. I think it's Second Corinthians uh, 517, I think it is. I should have written that down. Uh, they think you can just, you're a new creation. So now you got to start over, which is fine to them. And now you just got to stop sinning. A little confession. Uh, we'll get through it here. But a new creature, we're just made totally different now. We're made alive. Okay. They teach it. Now that you can start your life over, but now you have your magic Jesus that'll help you stop sinning. We have an operation made without hands. We are separated from our flesh. We talk about that in, over these presentations. The test is to make sure, in First John, is make sure you have the mark of God. See, that mark of God will protect you not only just during the tribulation, but to, during uh, today's time as well. You're always being protected if you've got that mark of God. Boy, if that isn't a, a corrupt teaching. And they get it from Ephesians 1.13. Well, that teaches that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So what they talk about, they, call, they talk about the mark of God, or they also call it the seal of God. No, not at all. We are sealed. 
That's just amazing what they have done to these modern Bibles. I'll tell you what the pastors are teaching. They are deceiving as bad as a politician, if not worse. Okay, their Bible says to do your best to present yourself approved unto God. In other words, it's all based on works. Uh, you'll find out that Peter's gospel is all based on works. Salvation by faith, supposedly some kind of way, but they got to have works to keep God in the relationship or, uh, anyway. And King James Bible tells us that when we uh, put, put our faith and trust in the risen Christ, according to Paul's teachings, we are now approved unto God. He makes us approved. We don't have to do our best to hopefully present ourselves approved when we finally kick the bucket. No, we are approved. It says we are accepted in the beloved, and the beloved is Christ, by the way. I accepted in the beloved. We are approved unto God, and we are accepted in Christ. Oh, I tell you, this stuff just gets me going. Okay, they reject the written Bible. They do own Bibles, but they're all the modern corrupt ones, and they used to read them a little bit. Now they don't even read them anymore. So they do own them anyway. They go by the spoken words because they've been taught that uh, John chapter 14, 1 John chapter 2, 27, teaches that they have the Holy Spirit, and now they're anointed. Well, that crowd who thinks they're doing the right thing See, this whole this whole thing by Peter teaches people that they're doing so well that God blesses them. And they are they are an unbelievably conceited, unbelievably arrogant, and massively judgmental towards others as well as to themselves. We study by rightly dividing the word of truth. That which is perfect, King James Bible, has come in the King James Bible. So that's what we study. We study the scriptures. We don't follow somebody's words. And one of my disappointments as a pastor, I guess, or as a teacher, is uh, how many people, even the King James guys, they still don't read the scriptures. They just read what their pastor says and uh, leave it at that. No, all my presentations, all my sermons for the last 20 years have been, I, put the, I, I should make everybody... Open your Bible, look at the scriptures, and want you to see that's what it says. And I, on my presentations here, I usually include the scriptures, unless I'm trying to keep it quick and short. Or, like in this case, the words are probably too small for some of your monitors, so I couldn't get all that stuff in. But we study the word of truth. We rightly divide the word of truth. We have in our hands that which is perfect. It came in 1611. They do teach that they need to do their best to imitate Jesus. I, I, this one amazes me, too. So I throw in, do your best to imitate your magic Jesus, because, see, they trust Jesus to guide them down the right trail and to keep them from evil. How do we keep from evil? From a King James Bible. We follow Paul. And God will let us do the dumbest things. We, should, we shouldn't have done them, but he'll, he'll allow it. We have free will. But these uh, Peter Gospel people follow, they think that their Bibles tell, well, their Bible tells them to imitate God, imitate Jesus. They even tell you to imitate Paul. We don't want to imitate Paul. We follow Paul, do the best we can, as he follows the risen Christ. No imitations there. Think about it. Uh, they think that they're imitating Jesus. That makes you an antichrist, to imitate Jesus. It's amazing. Okay. Uh, I could talk so much. Watch those signs. So these people will be watching those signs and, you know, miracles, uh, healings, uh, wonders, poison, drink to poison, all that stuff, and nothing happens to them. They see this as signs, and they see those signs that tells them, ha-ha, see, we are safe. God will take care of us. So they watch for those signs. We, we look to the goodness of God not the severity of God. See, to them, if they're doing the right thing, they'll be blessed. If they're doing the wrong thing, God will punish them. That's the fear of the severity of God. We don't have to fear the severity of God. We have to fear is our own thinking ourselves. We are our own worst enemy as far as it comes to doing works that match to the judgment seat of Christ. And we do the wrong thing, God does not stop us. How many of you have noticed God does not stop you from doing something stupid or wrong, but it's not a sin, because we're dead to sin. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, um, it wasn't I that did it, it's the sin that dwelleth in me. 
Anyway, so the goodness of God leads to repentance, and the severity of God actually, to me, leads people away. How many people like to be uh, punished for doing something? How many people, uh, teenagers, you know, they get tired of hearing the the uh, the fear of God, the severity of God, because what happens here, the pastors will teach the severity of God for doing something, and kids will realize, or young people will realize that, you know what, I did something really stupid, and God never punished me for it. So after a while, or they do something really good, and they're not blessed, after a while, they come, I don't think God's real. This, I see it happen. I've seen it happen over these years many, many times. In fact, I know some situations. Anyway, so it's amazing. I hope I'm not going too fast here. This is the new life that comes with people that follow uh, Galatians 2 7 when it gets changed to the gospel that Peter teaches. No, he doesn't teach it to the gospel, of the, doesn't teach that to the Jews. He doesn't, Paul doesn't teach that same gospel to the Gentiles. There is actually the gospel of the uncircumcision. That's Paul's. And there is a gospel of the circumcision. That's what Peter teaches. But right now, we're into the Gentiles. He had his chance in the first couple of chapters of Acts. Follow Beatitudes and the Commandments. Do you know that the Beatitudes, there's at least five things that you can't even do today? It's not even possible. I got a, I got a whole bunch of, uh, I got a lot of sermons on the Beatitudes, by the way, based on what Paul teaches. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a long series, but it sure does expose the Beatitudes for false doctrine if, if applied today. And the commandments, uh, follow the Beatitudes and the commandments. Oh, the Ten Commandments, they were not even given to the Gentiles. They were given to the Jews. And by the way, as we'll point out here in a few minutes here, uh, we only have, Paul only re repeats nine of the Ten Commandments. Which, co which commandment doesn't Paul teach? Remember the Sabbath day, Colossians 2.16. Anyway, they also teach that you need to imitate your shepherd, that's your pastor, and that he has joy or you'll be accountable for it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 17. That's their power verses. That's the pastor's control verses, how they control you. Uh, they're very prideful people. Uh, the pastor teaches that you must be in church anytime the doors are open. They expect you to tithe. Uh, and anything else you have, according to Matthew, give, all, give, it, all those, give it all to those in need. Make sure you get those special prayer meetings, those prayer circles, and the holding hands in a, in a satanic circle prayer meeting going here. So keep those special prayers going, especially repeat. You can buy books of prayers if you can't come up with one. To love everybody, love all. And they look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 47 for the church design and their goals. And that's why they're letting the music in. That's why they're bringing the music in that they are, because they're getting it from Acts 2.47. Check that out if you've never heard that before. And they constantly are fearing that they have lost their relationship with God. Okay, so they don't lose your salvation. But listen, if you don't get right with you don't get your heart right with God and you keep this up, you're going to lose a relationship with God because he's going to pull away. Well, I know we're not supposed to grieve the Spirit, and we're not supposed to quench the Spirit, but there's nothing in the Scriptures that tell us that God will leave you fellowship-wise. You know, when somebody said, I remember asking pastors, so, so if I don't confess my sins, what's my problem? I don't have any sins to forgive. They're all taken over by Christ. Well, if you're just not doing the right thing, you know, God will, you, you know, your position with God will just will change. You'll, he'll leave you for a while. Relationship. That's nonsense. What kind of a God would do? What kind of a parent, when your kid messes up, and you just throw them out in the woods and say, well, here, you're on your own. Okay, get back to the trail here. And I'll tell you, this is the big one here. The people are under constant pastoral control. Anybody in power today, the politicians, they want to control. They want to control America. They want to control the cities. The city government wants to control the, the people. Pastors are the same thing. They want to control their congregations, and they preach sermons of guilt all the time. So by the time you're done with their sermon, you're feeling like a rotten Christian sinner. And so you go up and you have your tearful invitation and all that kind of stuff. And that's just bogus, completely bogus if taught today. It really is. A lot of that stuff never was uh, taught anyway. On Paul's side, we follow Paul's manner of life, but not we don't imitate it. We follow it. We try uh, for growth and understanding. 
you can tell you're growing in the Lord because you're understanding more and more. It's not about a brain full of scholarship full knowledge. It's about understanding more and more. And like I said, when I got into this creation versus creature, I got more understanding to realize this is what's going on. They have a new creation, so they have to start, they have to stop sinning. We are a new creature. We are dead to sin, dead to the law. We're made alive. We're, we're a new creature. They just want to start over. Who wants to start over? Well, you can just confess your sins. We don't have to do that. We follow Paul's manner of life for growth and understanding. Any works of religion, you know, communion, all the stuff that people do uh, in the churches and all that stuff, it's just going to burn. We are not sheep. Paul never calls us sheep. We don't need a shepherd. We can learn. We can learn how not to be tossed to and fro from all every work, every, what's that say, every, uh, from every doctrine. I can't quote that thing. I'm terrible at memory these days. We have a King James Bible. We do not need to be sheep. If you're if you're just listening to your pastor, just listening to YouTubes, and never looking up the scriptures to double check it, you don't know how to rightly divide, and you're just going, oh, this guy's good. You're just acting like a sheep. You don't need to. You get that Bible, open it up, and study the Bible. Study those scriptures. We pray without ceasing. We don't have any special prayers. It's just like talking to him all the time. Uh, we're in, we are in church 24-7 because we're in the body of Christ. We're not in some local assembly every time the doors are open being taught uh, false doctrine from the, from the apostles and Peter, and we're not bringing in crummy worldly music and, and uh, dress standards, and we're not, uh, uh, okay, the whole thing is in there. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, 38 to 47, read it. That's what they're trying to do here. And so we have church every day because we're living in Christ. We are part of the body of Christ. Even that's an argument with people. Well, what kind of Baptist are you? Are you a brighter Baptist? Are you a Lutheran? Are you part of the body of Christ? Oh, people, please. Anyway, Paul does teach the commandments of God, uh, by the way, but they're not his law. They're not the law. And he only does nine of the ten. But everything else Paul teaches, he also says, are the commandments of God. So what Paul teaches is the, are the commandments of God. It's just the way it is. Make sure, this is the, this is back to the Peter side here again, make sure you are water baptized properly. And I emphasize properly, because I did have a pastor one time tell me, well, you ever, were you baptized? Well, I was baptized in a certain kind of church. He said, we need to be baptized in the Baptist church. Well, okay, whatever. I didn't know. And he took me to somebody's private swimming pool and had me baptized there. And I thought, well, what's the point of having a private baptism? There's no testimony of it. There's nobody else there. It just, it's just crazy stuff. Religion, I'll tell you, the Baptists are as bad with it. Matter of fact, it's the Baptists that started uh, the Great Commission uh, misapplication and the lie today. Talked about that in part two, I think it was. So, uh, Make sure you're water baptized properly. Don't skip communion, the Lord's Supper. Confess all your sins. And by the way, they always, they always like when they're done, they say, if there's any other sins I forgot, please forgive me. Oh, you know, if that were to be the case, that doesn't work. Well, Dad, I did some dumb things at school. I can't remember what they were, but I did some dumb things at school today. So just forgive me for all those things I did. I don't know what they were, though. That doesn't work. And uh, the blanket, the blanket request, you know. Uh, but to do confess your sins, to make sure your heart is right with God, then the evangelist comes along to get on the piano and he says, "Is your heart right with God?" And he sings this song, and people are crying and coming to the altar to get their heart right with God. How do I know that? Been there, done that. Oh, those are terrible years I wasted in my life. And they always fear the severity of God. And my favorite little story is when Paul meets these guys on Mars Hill. And he talks about them worshiping an unknown God. People today in this man, fantastic, uh, evangelistic, growing globally worship uh, nonsense, they all are worshiping an unknown God. If there, is a, if there is a chapter in Acts that reaches out for today, that's the one where it talks about on Mars Hill. Paul's sermon on Mars Hill is marvelous to be applied into churches today. Okay, so in, in Paul's side... And remember, this is the gospel of the circumcision. This is what Paul teaches. That's the Paul's gospel. Uh, spiritually baptized, we don't need water for that. 
Crazy. We commune with God. We have communion. Every time we read that Bible, we can talk to him through our, our daily prayer, and we can hear from him by reading the scriptures. And the Spirit of God will work to you, work through you, work in you as you read and as you study. Unless, of course, you have, you know, quenched and grieved the Spirit in your walk, but you still open up that book. God's still there. But if you don't open up that book, you're the one that's breaking the relationship with God, not him. He's always waiting for you to open up that book and read and study and pray. He's always there. So that's your communion. Breaking bread. Sure, you open up that Bible and study and read your breaking bread with God. Remember him through the King James Bible. That's what the communion is all about. Do this to you in remembrance of me, like those silly little religious church tables in the front of your church. Those uh, expensive oak collars. Remember in remembrance uh, that's that's just nonsense, church. Does. So we remember him. How do we remember Christ? Through the King James Bible. No reason to forget unless you quit reading. We have no sins to confess. Our heart is always right with God. What's wrong in it, what's wrong with us is what's in us. And we are still approved unto God. And my works that we've done will go to the judgment seat of Christ. I know I'm repeating this stuff, but how many people out there maybe still haven't heard this before? And we also are able to see the dangers of Satan's deceiving false worship today. And if you don't know anything about music and you don't know what's going on in this world of, of music and worship, you're, you're, you have to be careful because uh, Satan is deceiving people with this worship stuff. It's global. So it's getting ready to worship Satan. Isaiah talks about Satan thinks he's, he wants to be the, the most high. He wants, to, he wants the one to get into worship. He's already getting it in the local churches. But pretty soon he's going to be walk. He's going to be down on this earth, walking around seeking whom he may devour, and uh, getting worship. If you don't worship him, he'll kill you. You take the mark of the beast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not, not, not the mark of God. Just crazy what be going on in our churches today. It's satanic to the max. Okay, this other side, Peter people, the apostle people. It seems to me that they're bearing with another Jesus, another spirit. And another gospel, and that's Paul's biggest worry for 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 the Gentiles is they'd be duped into another Jesus, and that's what's happening. I don't make the call about individuals; I'll leave that up to God. But I'll tell you, doctrinally, these people are way, way, way off the mark. And on our side, Paul's gospel of the uncircumcision, there is a massive conspiracy of hate to destroy Paul. It still exists; it was in Acts, and it's still going on today. They reject us as well as the King James Bible, and they reject Paul's teachings, and they call us a hyper, hyper-dispensationalist, and some even go with, oh, you're just but one of the easy believers. Yeah, it's called the goodness of God. Marvelous stuff. You ought to check it out. Not complicated and confusing like your stuff over there with the, ap the apostolic doctrine and Peter. And yet, as I thought of this the other day, it's amazing, and they call this all the good news. They call it, so you get born again, you get a new life, you can start over, you can live your life better now, and God will bless you if you're doing the right thing, and God will punish you if you don't. And uh, we don't have to have scriptures, we can go by our own feelings, all that kind of stuff, and God will get you if you do the wrong thing. That's good news? No, 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 no. Paul is the one that teaches the good news. It's the best news you'll ever hear. And like Paul said to the Jews, you guys don't think you deserve it. I don't think I deserve it either, but I'm willing to trust the scriptures and trust what Paul teaches. I'm more than willing uh, to put my faith in the risen Christ and put my faith in his words that God inspired and preserved. And that which is perfect is complete. It's done. Everything I've got in that 1611 Bible, I can learn it if I just would learn it. My problem is at 74 years old, I'm not remembering it. That's what bothers me. But it is. It's the best news ever. Okay, let's just put these in just for the sake of we got to get a couple of these things in here. So this is another quick one here. Why do you think church people tend to look forward more to their disappearing rather than his appearing? Well, how do I know that? Well, because I hear people all the time, oh, things are getting so bad. It's so evil out there. Well, it is, no doubt about it. Uh, I, can't, I just can't wait to get out of here. Well, how about we love his, his appearing? So why is it that people are more willing to get out of this mess than there really are to see him? Well, it says, Paul says in 2 Timothy, I have fought a good fight. 
I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Well, yeah, Paul, you totally deserve that, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Now, you got to get this here. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So why is it that people are more excited about leaving than they are to see him? Well, people are taught to look for signs. We're because they've been in the in the in the Peter side, they've been uh, looking for signs. The signs, the falling away is the falling away of America. No, it's not. We've lived. Most of us that are older have lived a harder life than we're living today. Still, some folks we didn't have water, didn't have bathrooms, had to go outside. We didn't have restaurants. We didn't have uh, the availability of gas. The cars weren't so safe to drive with all their big engines today. Uh, not a, a whole lot of people could afford to buy a house. I mean, it's just, we're not, you got the, you got the depression, you got the dirty thirties. We got the world wars going on. Life has been much harder than it is today. So it's not the falling away. I'll tell you what it is at Romans eleven twenty two, And if you haven't heard me say this before, uh, we're not looking for signs, but what we do see is if, if the, when the Gentile nation turns away from the goodness of God, then God will cut off the Gentile nation, Romans eleven twenty two, And when that happens, the Holy Spirit, 2 Thessalonians, will take off. We'll go with them because we're sealed in the Spirit. And the tribulation comes. When How do we know when the Gentiles are done with the goodness of God? Well, listen up here. Paul is the only apostle that teaches the goodness of God. Not, not in any rest of the books does the word do the words goodness of God appear. And even in modern Bibles, where it does say goodness of God in, in Romans 2, 4, 2, 4 and Romans eleven twenty two, 22, uh, the modern Bibles change it to kindness, all sorts of dumb stuff. So when the, when the Gentiles are done with Paul, and Paul in the King James Bible rightly divided, you only find the goodness of God in the King James Bible, then it looks to me like a lot of people are against Paul and they don't like the King James Bible. So as that King James Bible gets more and more illegal and becomes a hate book, and when the Gentiles don't want to hear about Paul, seems to me that's just about everywhere these days, then that's when the Lord's going to come back, when the Gentiles reject Paul and God's goodness. So what people are doing, they're taught to look for signs. So they're not looking forward to his appearing. They just want to get out of here because things are pretty rough out there. So they're just looking at a daily life. Okay, how about they're feeling guilty because they haven't fought a good fight. They didn't keep the faith very well. And so they're more excited about leaving. They really kind of don't want to see Jesus. They, they haven't done a very good job down here. Uh, and every man that striveth the master is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So why don't we want to see Jesus? Well, we haven't always been temperate. They love, they love that, content, that corruptible crown. We're having a great time in this, high, this world of tech. This technology is becoming so evil, unbelievably evil. We even have the, uh, uh, what do they call it, artificial intelligence living. Uh, the mark is available. It's uh, all sorts of things. So that corruptible crown, you just get yourself a good job, make a lot of good money, get your bolts. You're just having a great time, aren't you? That's why, you know, you're more, but you're still excited about leaving. Life is getting harder. People are losing their jobs, can't buy gas like we used to, all sorts of things. So uh, they're now they're ready to go, but they're still not anxious to see him. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? We should be happy. You know why we're not happy to see, to see Jesus? Because a lot of people don't have a clue and they don't remember what Christ really did to us as well as for us. They forget that we're made alive. They forget that we've been dead to sin for all these years. They forget we've been dead to the law. We forget about that operation we had. We forget that. We forget about the goodness of God. We find ourselves fearful for the severity of God, just like everybody else. We don't have that joy. When we when we realize that we are approved unto God right now, anything we do will either build or burn. But we won't. 
What a marvelous thing. We don't have to play religion. We don't have to listen to a pastor browbeat us on a sermon and get us crying up to the altar at the end. We don't have to pay money we don't have to keep the percentage going. We don't have to take that ritualistic Catholic-looking communion. We don't have to have a baptism in water in the lake or in a river, cold water, hot water. Do we... Do we um, Immerse completely? Do we sprinkle babies? All sorts of crazy. Don't have to worry about that stuff. We can remember him through a King James Bible. We don't even have to learn just in part. And we don't have to learn based on our feelings and our thoughts because that's not the way it works to the Gentiles. Remember, we're Gentiles. We are not Jews. We don't get what the Jews are been told. Uh, we become one. So there's more to that than that comment. But still, we're Gentiles. He gave the King James Bible to the Gentiles. He gave all these things, the goodness of God, to the Gentiles. So people tend to forget what Christ really did. And when I see him, I want to just basically say, after, after a million years and I finally get off the ground, my face, just, you know, thank you for what you did to me and for me. So, yeah, we want to see him. I'm ready to go, but... I don't think we're going to go. I have a feeling I'm even probably going to have to do the dying thing. But either way, I'm going to see him someday. And that's what we're looking forward to. And if that's the case, just like Paul said, he got a crown of righteousness because we love his appearing. Uh, one of the reasons people are looking forward to leaving instead of seeing him is they didn't commune with God enough to remember or to learn anything. And that's your Bible reading. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Most of us are still hooked on America and the fleshly pleasures of the world. Moving along to the last question. Do you believe and teach that we are in the Laodicean church age today? Well, for you, for you uh, seven church people in Revelation, first three chapters there, um, if you think that we're in the Laodicean church age, and I understand the churches, I understand we're Philadelphian. If that's what that's all about, then we'd be Philadelphian. Uh, if you think that we're in the Laodicean church age, you're wrong. You're a Paul rejecter, and you're following someone who is uh, a Paul rejecter. And the pastors would use some of the verses in Revelation chapter 3 in the Laodicean church age to put those guilt trips on you, make you feel horrible. I know they try to apply these in their sermons and guilt, and there's control. Well, how do you know that? Because I used to do this. But Paul doesn't teach this stuff. Remember, it is the goodness of God, not the severity of God, that leads people to repentance. Romans chapter 3, verse 15. You've heard this in your church. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So either get your act together in church or just sit in the pew. Well, from what I can tell, everybody's just sitting in their pew. It seems like to me they're all pretty cold, but they'll put this sermon on you. You know, get yourself warmed up. Let's get rolling here. Get that checkbook out. That's how they prove that one, by the way. Then they also teach, though, that because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. God does not spew us out of his mouth. Paul doesn't teach that at all. We are not in the Laodicean church age, people. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and we say that, and we are, and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's basically true. I know some folks out there that are majorly struggling. If I had a lot of money, I'd help them. I don't. Um, I don't know what to say to them except hang in there, you know. Uh, and then he says here, and knowest, now that thou, knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Well, with Paul, we all realize that we're wretched. Paul's Romans chapter 7, uh, he wants to do the right thing, but when he wants to do the right thing, the wrong thing pops up in his mind, and that's a great set, great series in there. So yeah, we're wretched, just like Paul, which by the way, a lot of people don't like Paul, because he's just like them, and they're just like him. But, uh, but anyway, uh, and miserable. Well, we don't need to be miserable. We're not poor. We're certainly not blind if you got a King James Bible rightly divided. Naked, that's referring to works. We can still do the right things. We still have the freedom in America and more, in more parts of the country than others now to still do the right thing. So that, that's all referring to good works. And, uh, you know, we can, we can do some good things. So 
That's not applicable to us. And that the big one is in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Paul does not teach that. Jesus does not rebuke and chasten us today. The, that's the sin that dwelleth in, and that's going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, and that's either going to that's going to burn. And the good things we did, it's going to build for some rewards there. And uh, God lets us do the stupid things. How does God keep us from evil? He tells us about it in the, in his King James Bible. And then whether you should or should not buy that thing or go there, you can learn from your scriptures. You really can. Not if you just look at it once or twice a month. God, here's, here's my favorite one. God promised to the Philadelphian people, which would be the uh, our era we're in, our age we're in today, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So we're, we have a promise that, to, that he's going to preserve his scriptures. We also have a promise that we're not going to be in the temptation, in the temptation, in the tribulation which is the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth. There you go. That's it. And uh, you want to move on, go to the end. If you haven't read these before, there's a kind of a touch-up finale right here. And uh, with that said, put on pause if you need to read all that. And with that said, like I said, let's move along here. It's time to say goodbye. I thought this was kind of cute, if it works. Yep. Goodbye, folks.